Okay, uh, so uh, welcome everyone to this uh, session on statistics and data analysis. So my name is Xi Jin from uh, China's Shanghai Jiao Tong University. It's my great privilege uh, to pro introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Professor Bing Yu. Uh, so Professor Yu is a Chancellor's dis Distinguished Professor and the class of uh, 1936, uh, second chair in the Department of Statistics and the EECS at the University of California, Berkeley. Her work has leveraged new computational developments to solve important scientific problems by combining novel statistical machine learning approaches with the domain expertise of her many collaborators in neuroscience, genomics, and precision medicine. She's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and of the American Academy for Arts and Sciences. She's past president of the Institute of Mathematical Science, uh, Statistics. She was a Guggenheim Fellow. She holds an honorary doctor degree from the University of Lausanne, Switzerland. She has recently served on the inaugural Scientific Advisor Committee of the UK Turing Institute for Data Science and AI, and is serving on the editorial board of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Uh, please, uh, Professor Yu, you can start your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Xu, for the very kind introduction. And it's a great honor for me to speak here. So today I'm going to uh, share our work on interpreting deep neural network to our trustworthiness. We live in the era of AI. Most things are being called AI these days, but um, I really like this quote from Bill Gates, AI is like nuclear energy, both promising and dangerous. And data science is really at the heart of AI today because many, many important discoveries and algorithms are data driven. And data science has three components, computer science, math and statistics, and domain knowledge. And in the middle is machine learning. And you can also see actually, this is, could be also a traditional definition of applied statistics. And data science is really a life cycle. It's not just a single step. If from, say we want to develop a treatment for cancer. There's a problem formulation stage, ideally done by doctors and statisticians and data science machine learners together. And then there should be a discussion about how to collect data or use public data. And then there's data curation and cleaning and whether you want to do visualization of data and then the more traditional stage of algorithm develop. So a lot of uh, research has been mostly concentrated on modeling and algorithms. But as you can see, there are many, many, many other steps in this whole life cycle to ensure that the clinical decision rule is trustworthy. We really need to worry about the whole data science life cycle, the many, many steps instead of just the modeling and algorithms. And one most important thing, which often ignored, is actually the human judgment call. We actually make many, many human judgment calls in the process. And we would like to have our conclusions not subject to the arbitrary human judgment calls, rather reliable human judgment calls, at least recorded. To be able to understand the human judgment calls and its impact, often we need to interpret our models and we have to also interpret every step along the way. And EU's General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, in 2016 already gives a right to explanation and demands machine learning and statistical algorithm to be humanly interpretable, right? Of course, this is a legal document. And there's a new regulation called um, Data Service Act or Digital Service Act that further explains for advertising platforms, what does it mean? for the uh, customers to have the right to understand the parameters for the recommendations. So you can see that there will be much collaboration between the legal uh, profession and also the AI and data science profession to really implement this law. 
here are just some examples to really ground the talk, right? I'll be talking about particular cosmology, right? How we can understand a deep learning model to figure out whether the algorithm to estimate the origin of the universe, what type of information this algorithm relies on. And there are other much um, probably high stake interpretation like radiology and also basic science biology and the typical machine learning tasks like uh, sentiment analysis. A lot of our work, it's really um, can be called scientific machine learning. What I mean by scientific machine learning is that we use scientific research to extract information, discoveries, and we also build scientific principles like symmetry in physics to deep learning models to enhance the machine learning algorithm to give the correct inductive bias into the algorithm so that reflect the understanding of science better. And we iterate, and there should be higher standards for scientific machine learning and machine learning because it's a science and we should have open and reproducible software. So my group has been working on interval machine learning, especially with this paper um, came out 2019 with my student, Jamie, Chandon, Riza, and Carl. We work on different aspects of this interval machine learning in neuroscience, biology, and also just machine learning. So here we define interval machine learning into a framework that at issue have three components, predict the accuracy for reality check, and also discovery accuracy to access, for human to access the model. This is we really discussing post hoc. That means the model already fitted. And both predicted accuracy and discrete accuracy should be understood in the context of relevance to a particular human audience and the particular problem. Often people put this um, kind of rough understanding about the trade-off between predictive accuracy and interpretability or descriptive accuracy. People think shallow decision trees like using medical decisions are the most interpretable, but probably it doesn't have the most accurate or high accuracy. Then you maybe go to linear logistic regression for binary classification and then random forest. And then even more complex is the deep learning networks. So I'm gonna expand on the deep learning networks. I won't talk about even my group also work on decision trees um, and random forests. Of course, everybody use logistic regression. Let me just expand down the deep neural networks or DNNs. So about 10 years ago, right? There was this um, really a wave of models starting by the so-called AlexNet. So it was propelled by the availability of this huge image public data set called ImageNet. There, were, there are like 1,000 categories and most people work on about 1 million of them. And then you see a jump from the previous methods made from computer vision, SIFT and FEs to about 60% accuracy for 1,000 classes together. So this is for people who haven't really taken too much into uh, investigation of the deep learning, the dense, Deep learning network is just a connected neural network, right? Neural network, actually the history goes back to the 1940s, but resurgence is really about, you have more and more depths and bigger because the computer power is available. So you have a linear layer, and then you have a nonlinear net, there's also max pooling, some normalization, and you move to the next layer. So the deep networks just have everything connected and people can interpret the different layers into like edge detect like wavelets we'll get back to and more sophisticated um, kind of uh, filters. And in the end, this particular graph de depict that you have something like more like a face recognition. Now, AlexNet is a special form of um, deep neural network or the con called convolution neural neural network. What happens that with all these filters, you make them move around with the same coefficients. So it's constrained a dense network to reflect the invariance in human vision. And then 2019, 2017, Transformer would propose, which had a lot to do with the earlier versions of recurrent neural network like LSTM. And for natural language processing, suddenly you see a jump of performance for 
many tasks, summarization, Q&A, information retrieval, translation, right? Here I show you two uh, curves that transform what really induce a huge jump of performance. And not just natural language processing, right? For vision, called VRT, then you also see the AlexNet with 60%, so accuracy jumped to 90% also. So this is a huge jump. And of course, there are different versions of transformer. It's really the popular structure and uh, architecture now for neural network. And of course, the alpha 2 really brought a lot of attention from the scientific community to deep learning because working with actually with biologists, uh, DeepMind people, part of Google in London, were able to have really huge jump of performance for protein folding. So they, they actually, the test data were completely now seen or were not even produced when people working on the existing data to try to uh, do protein folding. So this is really make deep learning very, very interesting to look at. But the relevance, as I bring back to our definition, is really the key, right? Whatever the method prediction is reality check, some, some form of reality check. But for science, we really want interpretation to provide insight for a particular scientific audience into a chosen scientific problem. And the scientific insight have to be validated either by previous domain knowledge empirically like verified or by new studies to calibrate against for trustworthiness, especially uh, factual information. For medical um, applications, then you really need to make the model transparent to the patient and doctor, so you own trust. So the doctor feel comfortable to use it and patient feel useful to be treated by agrim, uh, at least aided clinical decisions. But where does the trust come from, right, you may ask? Relevant scientists, we work with scientists to provide conforming, confirming scientific knowledge to the interpretation. So the interpretation definition we defined in our earlier paper was really looking at post hoc. That means the model was already fitted, trained. But really we have to extend the checking and scrutinization upstream to look at where the model comes from. Right, you want to make sure the process that produced the model, the clinical decision for cosmologists are really quality controlled. So that's the second part of my talk. So first let's just look at the, a few applications of uh, or introducing the research project my group has been doing. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna introduce a general uh, interval machine learning method called ACD. It's based on an earlier method called contextual decomposition, which you can look at different entities, say in an image, not just a single pixel like a gradient based, but cluster of pixels or patches of pixels. So you can look at compositionality and also um, interactions. And then we have two scientific projects, one from cosmology, are from cellular imaging, that we can distill adaptive wavelet from much larger deep learning networks. And I have interoperability and also scientifically meaningful. And then I will end with the general framework for quality control data science process, what we call PCS, which stands for predictability, computability, and stability. So we want to learn future interactions and want to visualize, organize these importance measures in a way that humanly uh, understandable. So as I said, most of the uh, interpretation methods have been based on gradient methods. And I just heard a talk yesterday at Simon's Institute that it's very problematic to look at the gradient base because uh, they might not be reflecting what's the most important thing, but it's still commonly used. And then you have occlusion-based method like SHAP, which is that come from statistics for any models, not just uh, deep learning models. So our method also can also be used for any fitted model, doesn't limit itself to, well, actually, no, our method actually limit to deep learning, what I'll talk about. There's some other ways things we develop might be more general. 
So this is an example from sentiment analysis where we started, right? You said the movie was good and then the LSTM will say it's positive, but you can give explanations, but about not and good. But we also want to give importance to a phrase, which is not good to capture the compositionality. So we want to give three important measures for this simple example. So the first paper um, came out 2018, uh, Claire, and we're able to really dig into the deep learning fitted model, already trained model, to trace where the, um, how you have original input, like not very good, and the part you care about is very good. And you decompose in an additive fashion into two pieces, and you trace through how these two pieces flow through the network. And then you enforce additivity and you come up with two measures for not very good, for very good, and the irrelevant part, you don't care for this one. So for every possibility of combinations or words, you can now come up with importance measure. And we later generalize to CNNs and general uh, neural networks. So, but you have many, many numbers now, right? It's still not humanly understandable unless you organize these numbers in uh, understandable fashion. That's the follow-up paper the next year, uh, Claire, with Chandon joining the project with Jamie, that we're able to organize into a hierarchical tree using the CD scores for the every phrase and the single words. So you look at not very good, each have importance measure, you decide which to put together. And then we chose very good from the CD because bring the biggest jump of difference in terms of importance measure. So now you know it's the sentence, the phrase is positive until you flip it's the last step. And you can look at a lot more uh, complicated um, sentences and do the same thing. Now human can understand uh, where the decision is made, the sentence is labeled as positive. And even though previously it was something quite negative because you see the reddish uh, uh, phrase, and then you can do similar things for, for images to say that, well, why this image is labeled, uh, labeled having a puck and skates are correlated. So this is not the cause of labeling, right? Skates, because often go is a puck. And therefore, when you skate, the algorithm predict there's a puck there. And we run human experiments to um, show that our methods, I won't have time to give the details, it's in the paper to show that for both, the first one is about, we compare with a corrupted model, hand-tuned by adding noise. And then our method, the, the dark bars really um, over three different um, data sets are uh, giving the best results. Mostly the MNIST, the digit data, everybody gives similar results actually. Um, our CD gives a little better result. And the second one is about trustworthiness. You look at the interpretation for different methods, which one is more trustworthy and can see that we definitely have the, uh, again, for the two harder data set have the best. And then for MNIST, uh, the another data actually has a uh, method has a better one, but ours is pretty competitive. So overall, uh, ACD gives the best performance. Then we're able to, with a visiting uh, student, Laura, we're able to bring back the understanding into the algorithm to decrease the reliance of the deep learning algorithm for some undesirable features. So example, by law, you shouldn't make this decision based on gender, then we can reduce the reliance. So this is more, the previous paper were really general uh, machine learning uh, studies that uh, using machine learning tasks. And then we moved into collaboration with uh, cosmologist Francois, Lanusi and his colleagues, and Aposta Wusuk joined our team to really see whether this machine learning algorithm will work for scientific machine learning. So by that time, Lanusi or Francois was already building his own neural networks to estimate this cosmology parameter called omega m, which determined the evolution of universe. So this is simulated data, that's why we know the truth, right? And then on the right, it's called the gravitational lens observation we can observe from a current telescope. So this parameter measures denseness of mass in the beginning of the universe. 
And Francois and colleagues already built the ResNet with 10 million parameters to estimate and give the best result because they have simulations so they can compare with different methods. And for them, the most important domain is frequency domain, not pixel domain. So we generalize our methods because science the relevance part. Remember, we keep saying we want things to be relevant and the relevant interpretation domain is actually frequency domain. So we're able to generalize our method to the frequency domain. And you can see the different frequencies and that's the uh, images. And we can have one number coming out the CD score for each of the frequencies. And it sees that around point between point two and point three, we have the most important measure. And this indicates, this is another proof that the high frequency simulations are not as important for estimating the omega M that might be able to help them to reduce the computation cost. And then I worked on wavelets in the, about 20 years ago. I always thought wavelets as the first layer of AlexNet and diction, come out from dictionary and learning as well. We want to bring that back. And there was also effort by a staff and Malay's group on scattering transform. So we said, can we distill data-driven wavelets, right? So the scattering transform is due based on a fixed wavelet. Because if you do Fourier transform, that's what we were led there by the physicists. Wavelets is really adaptive wavelet, adaptive for a transform. So it's very natural that we do go to the wavelet domain, but we want to do data driven. So we actually have external study from cellular imaging. That's why we have um, the last co-author on the paper last year, uh, Gako Yupa Yayula, who is the head of our advanced imaging center to join the team to help us uh, validate our methodology, which develop in completely different scientific field from cosmology. So distillation was already there when we started the project um, to come up with smaller uh, neural net model from a big one. All people have tried use editing models and decision tree to distill from a more complex deep learning model. Our goal was to learn a data-driven wavelet. So when you have a mother wavelet, then everything else, it just becomes uh, very straightforward to have all the different filter banks, different frequencies, and then you um, can then do maybe a linear or other method to, to really uh, connect with your response variable. So this is a very simple introduction. I think for this crowd, probably it's not necessary. You read the wavelet really tile the uh, time and frequency domain in a more smart way than time series and frequency uh, and Fourier transform, right? So you can spend less energy on the high frequency uh, band and then allow the frequency to change over time. And there are great books by Malad and Mayer. And we use orthogonal uh, wavelet transform, which is um, invertible. So the two dimensional wavelet transform has a lot of attraction, right? You, you can, have on the mathematical side, we have the Gabor wavelet transform. And the first layer of AlexNet, which I mentioned, also have this wavelet looking. Right. And then you go back early to the 50s and people did the physiology work, Hubble and Whistle, to show that the first layer of visual, human visual cortex or uh, primary visual cortex, actually that's what they work with cats, that also have this edge detection, frequency and orientation selection. And then you can also get this um, similar thing as wave AlexNet, which a task-driven uh, supervised learning to, if you used to dictionary and learning, you also get something quite similar. So this has a lot of biological and also um, machine learning evidence to say this is the right decomposition for the first layer of uh, natural images. So what we did was very similar to what we did for Fourier transform. Suppose you have a wavelet transform and it's orthogonal, then you have a inverse transform and you already have a deep learning, which is um, pre-trained, which we have for the cosmology with 10 million parameters and you make the inverse transform together into F. If you know the wavelet transform, then you can calculate this um, F's kind of L1 sparsity norm. And then you also enforce orthogonality by saying that you want the first term in your loss function to be reconstruction or to be small, so that it's more like invertible. And then we added wavelet law to put in the constraint. So you're not considering any transform, you're considering something through like a wavelet through the low pass and high pass filters. 
And so how do we design such um, transform? We're going to do numerical gradient, uh, uh, stochastic gradient optimization to minimize this loss function. So the first term is clear to so reconstruction loss. The last there is just using derivatives. And let me expand on the middle uh, term. So the middle term is really we turn all the equations, giving a mother wavelet, you will have a program to expand into low pass and high speed filters, right? The uh, H and Gs. And then they need to satisfy, if they come from a mother wavelet with certain nice conditions, they have to satisfy these equations. So we turn these equations into penalties to enforce. So we turn every equation, square them, add them up, and that's become one term in the second term of wavelet loss. And we didn't take independent um, constraints. We actually took many different constraints. They could overlap and put them into our uh, wavelet loss function. So this is really just turning all the constraints, square them, make them a loss. And that's what we get, right? Looks complicated, but actually just lift it out from uh, standard wavelet textbooks. Okay, so then we, because there's equivalence from the low pass and high pass filter with wavelet, we can now optimize in terms of the H and G and get the data driven wavelets. So that's already mentioned. This is just taking the F, putting them together, and then do a derivative, and then uh, able to get L1 penalty to enforce sparsity. Okay, so that's what we did. So we took the ResNet, our cosmologist developed, and then got a data-driven wavelet, we call it distilled wavelet. And in cosmology, they already use fixed wavelet, have a peak counting measure. We just fit that peak counting measure for the downstream and predicted omega m. So you look at the table down there that AWD, which means adaptive wavelet uh, distillation has the smallest uh, error, one, about one. And you look at ResNet, ResNet is 1.15. So we reduced the um, error by about 15%. And then you look at WSG wavelet phi, DB5, and that's much higher. And the robot cross is another wavelet. It's also higher. And Laplace, in, Laplace is another one. And peak height is even higher. Right? So you can see that ResNet gave the best result. That's why we start working. And with 10 million parameters. And if you don't use the ResNet, the last number, and that's 1.3. So you can see that combined wavelet with ResNet give you more gain, we get one instead of 1.3. And ResNet itself get 1.15. So we're able to reduce the number of parameters from 10 million to about 1,000. And that's a huge reduction of 10,000 in terms of fold. And if you look at the wavelet obtained, right? Oh, sorry. This is actually the, I should give it. It's actually symmetric. I flipped the, 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 the type. So this is another, this is one for the cellular. So what, let me just describe. What you have is actually what you picked it's a symmetric wavelet to say that you capture the mass up and down uh, around the uh, region. That's the most important information about OPR. So it's a symmetric wavelet. Just imagine that I got last night, I got flipped the, the slide. So this is actually for the imaging, for the cellular imaging uh, Im uh, for this problem. Yeah. So the one we got for cosmology was actually a symmetric wavelet that saying that we take the peak and the contrast next to the peak. That's where you have the most information about omega, right? it's because it's about uh, mass. And this, so now we have developed this methodology and we want to be general applicable, not just for this particular scientific problem, but for general scientific problem, which is the second problem we were already working on uh, for a separate project. We decided to see whether it works for this project. So this is from cellular imaging. And we're looking at a particular, very important standard cellular process called uh, clathrin mediated endocytosis. So this is, this is a, one of the most standard uh, process for cell to get food and nutrients inside the cell. So it's a key process for vascular trafficking 
that spots a wide range of cargo molecules from the cell surface to the interior. Actually, um, Omicron for COVID, the more the recent variant, use this process to get into a cell. The earlier variants of uh, COVID actually use a different process called cell fusion to get into the cell. So this is now, I think, partly maybe why Omicron is so uh, contagious because can use the normal process, which is the most popular for normal cell function to get in. But the problem with this process, you can see the cargo um, get attracted from something inside with biomolecules, and then you become a ball and the scissor action, it comes in. But sometimes this process gets started by clustering, but doesn't finish. Say the unpacking doesn't happen. So this food still didn't really get in or didn't get, cannot be used because the ball didn't get unpacked. So this is one of the called um, molecular partner problem. Two biomolecules work together to establish a function for the cell. And this is the classroom imaging, right? very high resolution. And then this is the uh, oxalin. It's another biomolecule, which is a better pre like indicator for this process to complete, but it's more expensive. So we want to use the orange images or the signals to predict when something really completed. And if you use deep learning directly for these kind of blurred images, it doesn't work. So we have to use the understanding into the microscopy of the process to extract to time series and then use LSTM, which is a recurrent neural network. In the beginning, we didn't have enough data, so we have to do a lot of feature, hand-tuned features to do predictions, but later we got more data, we were able to do LSTM. And then it's the similar method with this still the wavelet. And this is um, up and down, like down and up. And then we just use the linear prediction, use the top 30 coefficient from this uh, data-driven wavelets. And from one thousand parameters, we're able to reduce to 30 parameters. So this is a very human interval. You can look at them and see where the information is. And again, we increase our score. Now we want to be higher because this is about a proportion of variability explained, but on a test set. So we can explain about 23% and then compare with LSTM, we can explain 26%, compare with the LSTM only 23%. And WSG wavelet can only give about 20%. And without the um, LSTM, the deep learning model, we can only do about 23%. So again, it shows that the wavelet in combination with the fitted deep learning networks give the most gain. So my intuition is that the deep learning is really good at search in the space in a very efficient way and go to a very good spot and then you distill and make things and, and fit that, use that instead of the raw data to do the wavelet distillation. If you don't use ResNet, as you can see, you just get data-driven wavelets, then you don't do as well. So again, you lose about 10 to 15%. So this is, um, you already seen it because I flipped the slides. This is a very different one, as I asked you to imagine. The first one was actually a symmetric wavelet. This is not a symmetric. And it really captured what we understood already by inspecting a lot of the data ourselves. It's really saying that the clustering fluorescence have to have a really sharp drop, come, come down and have a sharp drop to capture that, to be predictive of a successful CME event. So this is also coincide with our understanding. And now you have a model with, um, 30 parameters. So what you see here is actually, instead of having this trade-off, right? That's what I show you. We're able to increase the predictive accuracy by 10 to 15%, but at the same time increased the interpretability. So my intuition is that when you have adaptive wavelets, which is physically, in physical sciences, captured the structure of the signal better, then you can have this, you don't have a trade-off, you can increase both predictive accuracy and interpretability at the same time. But deep learning, because the search ability did give us a good place to distill, right? If we don't use deep learning, we don't get as good result. So this is really a collaboration between deep learning with using huge um, search power 
and then same time using insight from Wavelets, which is very um, beautiful mathematical object to work together to get where we are. Both have the interpretability and also in terms of performance. So we didn't really have this trade-off, right? We actually increased both. So back to the data science life cycle, right? So those um, models were already fitted, right? And if we want to look at the data science life cycle, we want to see where the model came from. And that's where we have developed a whole uh, framework called PCS to help people to do critical thinking and to do documentation to really check whether we have conform and to really remove as much objectivity, uh, subjectivity from not well-founded human judgment calls, right? If you have a really good human judge call you want to use like Newton's law, use it, right? That's, we saw that science, but there are a lot of things in the in between, right? From Newton's law to another doctor's call, but that's where you have to write it down. And if you really trust your judgment call, you can use it, but you should document it. And some things say, oh, maybe this way, that way, then you should do both ways and really see whether the results will change. So the part three is about building a quality controlled data science life cycle, right? Statistics, we always have this uh, in for factory floors, we develop a car manufacturing uh, quality controlled process for that. But now we're really looking at more dry lab and we still have this multiple steps. So we need to build in uh, quality control ideas to share the best practices. So that's where uh, we wrote this paper with my former student now at UCSA, Kang Kumbir, a period at PNAS, uh, 2020, we start a new term called vertical data science. Vertical data science was actually suggested by a friend from Colombia, Tian Zhang, who came up with this term, I used to call my uh, talk three principle data science. Vertical means truthful. So we want reliable, reproducible information, I also have enriched technical language, especially to describe complex model like deep learning. We don't have enough terms to describe what's going on in the fitting, in the performance of the model. We also want to take very seriously um, empirical evidence in context, talking to the domain experts. Of course, domain experts also can have uh, biases, right? So we really want to use machine to help us see the human biases and vice versa. Hopefully we get to the better place with the collaboration. We really want a quality controlled uh, data science life cycle. So the PCS framework, as you have heard, is really combined machine learning with statistics. Predictability is taken from machine learning and statistics and computability. We expand computability from rates of convergence, speed of computation and storage to also include data inspired um, generative probabilistic models so you can test your method with knowing the truth. And stability is a huge expansion on uncertainty from statistics, like sample to sample variability is one data perturbation and also robust statistics, which is model perturbation and also from control theory. So it's, it's really a big umbrella to unify, streamline and also expand on ideas and best practices for quality control data science life cycle. So we have this cute image and to show that the three go together to give you the trustworthiness or veracity. I actually embarked on embracing stability principle like 10 years earlier when there was quite a bit um, publicity on irreproducibility of uh, biological experiments and really advocated stability, which include now both data perturbation as in traditional statistical method, but also generalized to data perturbation from mechanism model. You might generate a PDE as a data perturbation. And today people do in deep learning adversarial attacks. That's also a form of data perturbation. Oh, data augmentation is also data. So that's all included in the data perturbation allowable under the stability analysis, whatever is relevant for your problem. And also put them together with model perturbation, right? We often have lots of choices. Even for deep learning, you have different architectures. You can do deep dense network, CNN, you can do transformer but you want to compare them relative to reality check. You want them to pass certain bar on terms of predicted accuracy and then seek stability. And later the stability principle was expanded to every step of data science life cycle. The first paper was about the modeling stage. 
you might want to worry about data cleaning stability, right? I have three groups of students working on the same data in a class. They clean the data in three different ways. One group cleaned the weight 23% of data on the clean data got the best result, but that's not as usable if you want to generalize that to a different hospital with a, a clinical decision rule data sets. So every step we need to worry about um, stability and even linguistic stability. When you formulate a problem work with biologists, matrix is a biological entity within the cell, right? And matrix for us means tabular data. So all of that needs to be cleared out and have a consistent understanding of stability of a word or language. Oops, sorry. Stability, I argue that it's also a common sense principle, right? Um, philosopher Plato said in his uh, dialogue manual that for true opinions, as long as they remain a fine thing, what they do is good, but they're not willing to remain long. So that means they're not stable. And that's why knowledge is probably higher than the correct opinion and knowledge different from correct opinion because they tie down. So tie down means stable. So this is a common sense principle. It used to be a philosophical principle, but we need a reality check first instead of just that one stability. And in terms of model to model variation or perturbation, climate scientists are already ahead of us, right? If you look at the global temperature rise prediction at the end of the century, you don't see one curve. You actually see nine curves because there are nine leading climate models. And together it gives us a more complete picture what might happen. So the temperature rise is ranges in this plot from 1.5 degrees to 5.5 degrees. And that's really a concept of variability already in the broad sense, because people not, this is not just sample to sample variability as a traditional statistic. This is about people make different judgment called simulator model. They might have used the data a little differently, the boundary condition differently. So this is a perturbation interval, but still very useful for us to have a sense, better sense about what would be the temperature than just one, any of the nine curves. So this is our call PCS perturbation interval, which we have also addressed in the 2020 paper, which I won't have time to uh, discuss. So using the PCS framework for our modeling stage, we didn't go back to the data cleaning. So we did a partial PCS analysis. You can see that if you do different randomization starting point and you get the same, uh, like wavelets. So that's pretty consistent. And then if you perturb the data, you also get similar. Um, so it's stable, the curve and the results. All of this need to be documented inside um, a document, Jupyter notebook or R markdown to connect the models, which is a constructed um, model or construct to reality. And you record your judgment calls. And then you might want to run a few different uh, possibilities, at least two, two data cleaning versions. So I, I'm advocating we should keep at least two cleaned versions of data and run down through the pipeline to see whether induce a big enough difference for concern. And you have to go back to see, to discuss what to do. So we have used this PCS framework in many other uh, projects in my group from medicine, neuroscience and methodology development and stress accessing a digital um, kind of decision rules. So um, take a look at our website. And we also have a software if you want to do PCS style analysis to make it easy called the vertical flow. And we also have a simulation in R. One is Python, one is R to help you to use the PCS framework. So for future directions, we're going to try to continue to really see whether AWD, maybe we can want to combine back with deep learning and to look at a more sophisticated versions of uh, adaptive wavelets for other transforms and then for other scientific applications and maybe connect with um, AWS mechanism models. On the PCS front, we have been teaming up with groups of people who have been using data analysis a lot to build that into their framework. And the last slide is that uh, we are finishing a textbook if you want to get into data science from mathematical side, this really give you from a common sense approach towards a data science that covers the whole data science life cycle. We'll have a free online copy. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, finally, I would like to thank the ICM uh, for this uh, wonderful Congress and thank Professor Pinyu again for her beautiful lecture.
Thank you, audience, thank you. for attending. Bye -bye. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Yes, we cannot see you, but thank you for coming. Thank you, Shi, for sharing the session, also ICM. Thank you. Thank you.